Hello, I'm Doug, and welcome to the Crew of Japan podcast, a weekly podcast where we take you on audio journeys through Japanese culture. This time on Crew of Japan podcast. All right, we've made it to the halfway mark. Okay, almost, if this would have been episode 10. But unfortunately, I ran out of a little bit of editing time before my trip to Japan. In fact, I'm recording this on the night before I'm flying out of New Orleans with nothing packed yet. Whoops. But anyway, if you couldn't tell by the title, we don't have a full episode here at the moment, but don't flip the episode off just yet. While, yes, this is an announcement of our mid season break while I'm out of the country for a couple weeks, this episode is also a big time preview of what's to come when things kick off again on June 23rd at noon central. See, that's not that far away. Anyway, While the first half of the season was releasing weekly, Jennifer and I have been plugging away on additional guest interviews for upcoming episodes. We even have Maddie rejoining us for another episode in the back half of the season. So, without further ado, let's take a quick sneak peek at everything coming up. Right out of the gates, the crew is coming out hot with our biggest guest yet, as Konishiki Yasukichi, three time grand champion in sumo, gives us a sneak peek behind the curtain into the life of a professional sumo wrestler. The top division, which is judo, you get 15 matches. You just have to win majority of the 15 matches, and he works up and down to the fit level and same thing. So, once you get in the sixth level or the top level, that's where all the big boys are. To become an o l d Zeki, you have to be a Seki Waki, which is a junior champion. When you're in the Seki Waki division, junior champion division, you have to have three consecutive, three tournaments. At least win 11 or more matches. You get promoted to Ozeki, which is very hard because you have to be consistent for three tournaments. You win at least 11 or more per tournament out of 15. So, and then the next level is once you make it as an Ozeki to become a Yokozuna, the best way to become Yokozuna is win back to back. And the only problem with being Yokozuna, once you become Yokozuna, and once you start losing, you have to kind of retire. Shinichi Mine of Tabi Eats returns to have a craving inducing conversation about all things ramen. The reason why I got into ramen so much, first of all, I didn't like ramen. I wasn't into it. And, you know, I thought it was very high in calories and, you know, it would be fat and unhealthy. <laughs> But Satoshi loves ramen. My partner, Satoshi, he loves it. That's one, probably his favorite food. He can eat ramen every day and he's happy. And he decided to take me to a ramen shop, and it was、uh, miso ramen in Hokkaido. And I was like, oh no, miso ramen, the one that tastes like miso soup, I don't know. But you know, he took me there to just try it. We went to this place called Sumire, which is quite popular for miso ramen. And it changed my life. Like, really. It's like, what? Miso ramen can be this good and have so much depth and flavor? And wow, that was like the best thing I've had. Had like in that whole entire year, and ever since then, I, I it kind of opened my eyes to the world of ramen and how much variety there is. And the same thing with shield ramen at first, shield ramen was my least favorite because it's just salt. But when I went to Hakodate, where they specialize in shield ramen, the salt they use is special for some reason, they taste different depending on the shop you go to. And something as simple as salt flavored broth can have so much depth and complexity. I was、um, blown away again. Being an artist in Japan, featuring Rachel of Tribal Bug Art. I thought a lot about like, why did I end up painting landscapes after I disliked them? And I think I was so moved by what I was seeing in Kyoto and in Japan and just kind of the affection that I felt for the, the place that I was living and experiencing that. I wanted a way to like keep it forever in a way that like I felt that taking photos wasn't quite doing for me. And when I make a painting working from life, which is what I do, I, all of my work is done on site and it is done from live observation. I'm creating a kind of connection with my subject that, I, that stays with me and will stay with me for the rest of my life. And whenever I pick up and flip through my sketchbooks, I feel myself back in that moment or looking back at that place. And so I'm hoping that, you know, wherever life takes me, I'm going to be able to look back at my sketchbooks and feel like I'm back in these places that, you know, have made such an impact on me. Maddie rejoins the crew as we sit down with returning guest Chris Nelge of TDR Explorer to talk about themed cafes in Japan. 
if there's like a popular anime or video game or some sort of like franchise, there'll be a lot of like different themed cafes. And the cafes are usually pretty standard in terms of like their food offerings, you know, but they will rotate out with the different franchises. Like we'll see things from popular animes. Like right now I saw there's a Chainsaw Man uh, pop-up themed cafe. There's a Disney cafe in Harajuku that continuously rotates every few months with a different theme. I think right now they're doing like a retro Kisaten theme, but with Disney, like Kisaten's the traditional Japanese coffee houses. And then we have like the more permanent cafes, like the Pokemon Cafe, the Kirby Cafe, the Final Fantasy Cafe. Like these are like um, ones that are permanent and they just, you know, change out their menu. And it's kind of widely known. You don't really go to these for the high quality food. Like the food's kind of, it's fine. It ranges from that to, oh, this is not great at all, but at least it's cute. So that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Um, it's, it's mainly for like pictures and getting exclusive merchandise, which we know Japan loves to do. And kind of, you know, supporting your favorite franchises, favorite brands, you know. Jen and I explore the do's and don'ts of omiyage culture. I think I bought so much Parlene's, yeah. which for those of you who don't know what that is, it's pretty much just like brown sugar that's cooked and you have like pecans in it. It's just, and it's just giant solidified <laughs> sugar. sugar. It's literally just sugar. <laughs> <laughs> sugar with some pecans in it. That's it. <laughs> like basically a cookie form. It's not really a cookie. It's not even a cookie though because it has no dough. <laughs> I know, but it looks like a cookie, sort of. Sort of. It's, like, it's, but it's like fudge. I think it would say it's closer to you fudge than cookies. Yeah, I'll give you that. I'll give you that. Not the same texture, it's but kind thinner. of like the same. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I gotcha. Yeah. Good Good comparison. If you're listening from another place that is in New Orleans and don't know what problems <laughs> yeah. are, P-R-A-L-I-N-E. Just look it up. You'll see. You'll see. They're yeah, really good, see. but not, not not really a hit Yeah, they, they weren't a hit. I only gave out maybe like three of them mm-hmm. because they were just, they were too sweet. Yeah. And that was something that I've heard. And I, I did that the first, I think it was either Jet, my first year, I brought that in. I went to like a praline shop down in the French Quarter or something to buy like one of the big boxes of souvenir ones. Mm-hmm. And of course, overpaid because it's the French Quarter. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I bought that and then I brought it to work. And then I saw some people taking it, but then they take it. I saw them kind of like open it, take a bite. And then it would just sit on the rest, their desk the rest of the afternoon until I left. And then magically they were gone the next day. I don't know where they went. (laughs) Oh, I know. (laughs) Probably in a tissue and then home and then into the burnable garbage. Author and 7th Don Kyoshi of Kendo, Alexander Bennett, sits down with the crew to explore the martial art of Kendo and its roots. And so by the time we reach the 1700s, so that's about 100 years down the track, I don't know what they called the blogosphere back then. There was a lot of criticism about what a lot of crap all this swordsmanship is and blah, blah, so-and-so school is really, really bad. And this is, you know, this is terrible. They're forgetting what true swordsman's all about. And one way that this problem was overcome was a number of prominent swordsmen developed special training equipment, which involved a protective head covering, gauntlets, body protector and bamboo swords and what this meant was that people or swordsmen could actually practice with each other now with full contact sparring that means that you could actually attack somebody and try out all of these techniques that you've been taught through the cutter and and so on and see if they actually work and see how practical they really were without fear of killing your opponent or or being killed And as this trend started to take root throughout the 1700s and the 1800s, people started to realize that, hey, this is really a lot of fun. It's basically fencing, right? Um, They could actually fight each other. And that meant that it actually brought, you know, introduced into it a a kind of a, a competitive aspect. Unofficial guest host of the Crew Japan podcast, Matt Alt, comes back to deep dive the history of the company that we all know as Nintendo. Even though these playing cards did really well, and he's selling like, at one point, they're selling hundreds of thousands of units a year, right? And he's dominating the playing card market. But Yamauchi isn't like the kind of guy who's going to be satisfied with just like simple success. And he realizes that, you know, no matter how big of a playing card company he becomes, there's limits to what he can do. And so he decides to start diversifying. 
and this is where things get really interesting. In the 60s, Nintendo is doing all sorts of crazy stuff, or I should say Yamauchi. He purchases a taxi company, and then he also, in concert with that, buys a share in and, and takes ownership of a love hotel, which is, you know, a, as you know, in Japan, by the hour place for trysting with your lover, right? This is the thing. There were a lot of newspaper articles at the time that were making fun of Yamauchi because, you know, he was reportedly a big customer of this. Like, it, it, it makes sense when you think about it because the taxi driver, you'd get into a taxi with your, your girlfriend or whoever it was and say, hey, you know a good place we can go? And the taxi driver is like, yeah, buddy, the Nintendo Love Hotel. And he'd take you over there, right? Or, or whatever Love Hotel that your taxi service was affiliated with. So this is like one step away from like being a kind of brothel type situation really it really it's pretty different than what you think of nintendo today nicholas mccullough coordinator of international relations in matsue city joins us to explore the wonder that is matsue city okay so there's i'm going to say that there's quite a few things but i will try to boil it down to a few specific examples one of these examples was actually it was about a month to two months ago i think it happened in at the very beginning of april and we had our Samurai Warrior Parade. And in Japanese, we call that the Musha Gyoretsu. And you have quite a few people cosplay some of the most famous and iconic characters in the history of this area, the lords of the time, the ones who are directly linked to the actual construction of Matsue Castle itself. And you have many people, not, not all of them are... This is not just limited to the people of Matsue, but there were actual participants in the parade that were coming from other areas of Japan, such as Osaka, from what I've been told as well. But you have many of the locals, they dress up in the traditional Japanese samurai garb. And for those who aren't familiar with the term samurai, it's not simply limited to that of warriors, but you know, this refers to a whole class of people way back when, and this included their families, their daughters, their sons, their wives. And with this, there comes such a variety in terms of the dress that was represented in this parade and the weather was fantastic that day. And it was honestly, I really wish that this was something that more people could see with their own eyes because it was literally just history unfolding in front of us that day. Along with a couple other topics that are still in the works. A lot of fun things coming down the pike with the crew, and we can't wait to share these stories and audio journeys through Japanese culture with you, starting back on Friday, June 23rd at noon central. Hopefully by then my jet lag will be gone. Uh, we'll see. Any of these topics got you excited? Or maybe you're thinking about season five already. Share that suggestion for a topic or a guest with us on social media. Here comes the part everyone loves, right? Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, YouTube. Just search Crew of Japan, K-R-E-W-E-O-F-J-A-P-A-N, Crew of Japan Podcast. While you're there, give us a follow, a like, a subscribe, a retweet, a share, a repost. What else did I do out there? Anything, whatever floats your boat. Let us know how you're enjoying the podcast. Or perhaps you prefer to provide your feedback in a more private setting. Send us an email at crewofjapanpodcast at gmail.com. K-R-E-W-E-O-F-J-A-P-A-N-P-O-D-C-A-S-T at gmail.com. Speaking of feedback, if you're enjoying this first half of the season, this preview episode, or looking forward to the next upcoming 10 episodes, or 11, 11, oh my god, I can't even keep track, please feel free to leave us a five-star review or rating on your favorite podcast streaming app. These reviews and ratings really do help others interested in Japan find the podcast, and any and all support is greatly appreciated. But that's it for today. Until next time, which is June 23rd. See you then.